Career Center YouTube channel. All right. I think I've addressed everything. Again, thank you so much again for your patience as we take on our first hybrid session. And without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Ms. Shayla, who is our Regional Peace Corps representative. So thank you so much for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Ms. Shayla, um, as I mentioned. And I am a current Peace Corps volunteer, but I'm also the recruiter here for the Washington, D.C. area, specifically American University and other universities throughout the metropolitan area. So um, when I first came in, I kind of got a feel of where everyone is in their, you know, in their time here at American University, but we'll have more time to talk about where you are and how fit, Peace Corps will fit into your, you know, your personal and or professional goals throughout this presentation. So as I mentioned, I am an RPCV and I had the opportunity to serve in the Dominican Republic from 2019 until 2020 due to the evacuation for COVID. But while I was there, I was working in a primary span, um, in a um, elementary school working on primary Spanish literacy promotion. So I was in our education sector and I also took on some secondary projects, which focused on teaching English as well as youth and development and you know, camps and um, programming after school hours. And so the language spoken was Spanish, but there also was some Haitian Creole that we learned working um, more towards the border. And before Peace Corps, I did attend the University of Maryland College Park, uh, studying broadcast journalism and Spanish. Awesome. So um, some of y'all, I think most people here said they already know about Peace Corps. They already have, you know, a foundation understanding of Peace Corps. Um, but I'm still going to go over, you know, what we are going to do in our mission. So we were founded in 1961 by John F. Kennedy uh, with the mission of promoting world peace and friendship. And so um, we fulfill this mission through three strategic goals. And our first goal is to uh, meet the needs of the country that we are serving by partnering with them on their certain projects that they have, localized projects, where we um, are collaborating. And so I love to highlight that we have to go where we are invited, that we can't just show up to any country and say, hey, well, we wanna do a project. I think you might need some help with this. That's not what Peace Corps does. They have already specified um, a certain area. You have two sectors, so it might be within one of our sectors, and then they have a specific project that they will have collaboration on from citizens such as yourself. And so that is what we come into the picture. And then our second goal is to um, promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of people served. Probably my uh, favorite part of Peace Corps is the cultural exchange. Our last goal is to focus on the cultural um, exchange. And so you're gonna go to a country and you're going to share about your perspective and your experience as an American. Every American has their own different, um, different experiences. And so sometimes you're going to countries where you might be the first American they'll ever meet. A lot of times people have, you know, preconceived ideas of what it is, what, what America is based off of, you know, movies, uh, you know, news, things of that nature. And so that's a very narrow view and it's not the wide scope. And so when you're a volunteer, you are a 24 seven ambassador for the United States essentially. And so you get to share about your unique experience with your host country, with your host community, with your host family. And so our third goal is kind of the reverse where you get to promote a better understanding of other people on the part of Americans. And so sometimes you're going to countries that maybe you've never even heard of or your family has never heard of and you, your, your family and friends might never have the opportunity to visit. And so you're gonna be living there in a very intimate way. You're going to be there for 27 months. I love to talk about that. Uh, you're there with them for two years and you're learning about their culture, their customs, language, food, dances, everything and so then from there you get to be an ambassador for them when you come back home you get to be the connection between the two so circling back to that um, creation of world peace and friendship you are that tie and so um to become um well i'll talk about that that in a second but you might be thinking why choose peace corps because i did mention that it is 27 months and that we are um that you are our volunteers and so people sometimes hear those two things and think why did I just do uh, four years of undergrad and pay all this money to then go be a volunteer for two years? Um, but there are so many great benefits because you are investing in your future. Working with Peace Corps, I love to stress you are working. You are learning skills. You are bringing skills as well. We are sending qualified U.S. citizens to work on these projects because they're looking for collaboration. They're looking for ideas, you know, to help with whatever it is that they have specified that you need assistance with. And so while you're there, you're going to receive intensive language skills and uh, training on the specific sector that you are in. And so that's what your first three months of service are. And then your other 24 months is where you're actually implementing all those skills 
and training into the projects that they have specified. And so within the school, you're going to learn how to be more adaptable. You're going to work in different environments. No one um, core project looks the same, even if you're in the same country, in the same sector, as long as your, your um, colleagues, your experiences can be completely different. You're going to, um, you know, work with people from different backgrounds. You're going to learn a lot about cultural competency and how to be um, flexible, how to be, um, just how to work outside of what you've already done. And that's going to be very transferable when you come back to the United States because I can't think of any organization that does not want to work with someone who has experience working with a different um, people from different backgrounds. Right now, we're focusing a lot on you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and working somewhere else with someone in a different language, living with them. You're living beside them. You are working at a grassroots level. You're not coming in for three months. I'm here to help you know build a school. You're really becoming a part of the community, and that is something that is so unique. And there's really no other organization that does that. And so your experience with Peace Corps, uh, that will carry you throughout your, your career and also your personal life as well. So that's a huge reason why I think that Peace Corps would be a great option for you. So how to become a Peace Corps volunteer? Fairly simple. The only has hard requirements is that you be at least 18 years of age and a U.S. citizen. So you don't have to be born in the U.S. You can be a naturalized citizen as well, but you do need to be on the U.S. And though 95% um, of our applicants do you have an undergraduate degree? Most of our volunteers do have an undergraduate degree. And we do have our students, but in case you have any friends or family who are not, uh, who do not hold a bachelor's degree, you do not, do not have to have one to be a volunteer. You can supplement that with five years of full-time professional work experience that is relevant to the sector that you are trying to work in. Um, and also never think that you have to be Peace Corps right away. Peace Corps is here for you whenever you are ready for it. Um, our oldest volunteer is 86 years of age. So that's just to say, you didn't have to do something you do right after college. I personally waited a couple of years between college and Peace Corps, just to give you an idea of the timeline and that you can also do Peace Corps as many times as you want. So I've known people who have done three different for, um, services. And so um, a lot of options in that regard as well. So earlier I was mentioning um, our sectors. I said that I serve in the education sector, which is our largest sector. Um, but we do have six. And so this is a glance at them, and I'll talk about them very briefly. Um, but we'll start with education because that's the one that I um, was a, a part of. And so with education sector, you can find yourself working primarily in a school. You might be working um, teaching English as a second language, as a foreign language, or teaching Spanish, in my case, um, in an elementary school. You can also find yourself teaching math or science. And then moving down to our community economic development sector, which is more like our business sector, volunteers are working with different small businesses and making them more sustainable and more lucrative and so sometimes that includes putting on different financial you know literacy workshops and finding ways that can um, help promote their business if you have business to get moving over we have our health sector our health sector you are not going to go to any clinical help people sometimes come to you think oh i want to work you know um you know with, with surgeries and i'm like we're not we're, you know we're not putting our hands on anyone in our in our clinical health in our health sector, but you are educating about different health projects and so different health initiatives, such as um, HIV AIDS awareness, water and hygiene sanitation, as well as maternal health. And so um, think of it more as, as a community-based health um, health project. In our environmental and agriculture sectors are very similar. You're working on um, sustainability and with agriculture, you can find yourself working with farmers and um, helping to make their um, crops more sustainable and gardening and uh, ways to spread um, working with food initiatives as well. And environment, just talking about ways to be more, to be more green and more sustainable in the community. Um, and that all kind of ties sometimes to our education sector. I always love to say that everything is gonna have a base of education because we are exchanging knowledge. And so you might not be in a classroom setting, but you will be um, in, a, in an educational type of field. And then last but not least, we do have our smaller sector, which is youth and development, where you'll be working with um, adolescents. You can be doing um, after school programming, a lot of times working on sexual health education with high schoolers and um, sometimes middle schoolers in different projects like that. And so at the bottom, you'll see that we have something in a box that says secondary projects. And that is what I mentioned in the beginning that I had the opportunity to work on a secondary project. And that's also something that I love about Peace Corps is just the opportunity to do more than one thing. So even if you come to service um, as an education volunteer, you might get to overlap 
you know, with um, environment or with human development. And so you have different interests and different desires and different um, backgrounds. You're all going to come in with different experiences. And so that is your opportunity to mix your interests with what the um, host country's interest is as well. So always going back to that, we're not doing anything that they do not want from us. And so they're going to, uh, sometimes you're going to have an idea and you can bring that forth to your community member and say, hey, I, I really am interested in maybe starting an after school, you know, financial literacy workshop. I think this would be really beneficial. And then you're going to have a partner who will maybe bring that forth to the community. And then they'll say, yeah, we would love to have that. And then from there, now you're taking on a second project. And so that's what makes Peaceful so dynamic. We're never just doing one thing. No one day is the same. Um, there's a lot of room for um, a lot of different opportunities and ways to think about it. And so from there, let's take a look at where we go. So um, before the pandemic, we were in um, about 60 countries. And so now we are slowly entering back into countries as um, they are ready, saying they're ready for us, as it's safe for volunteers to, to return and safe for the um, host community as well. So we want to make sure that we are respecting them also. And so um, you can find yourself, you know, in the Caribbean and the Dominican Republic, like myself, or in um, Latin America, in Peru, you can find yourself in Africa, or Africa region is our largest, or also in the um, Europe, Mediterranean, and Asia regions. And so um, our website will always have the most up-to-date place where we are. And um, you always have the option of serving wherever, you know, where you need it most. And so sometimes people don't really have a preference of where they want to go. This is a great idea to see all the possibilities and uh, know that you can choose a country where you want to serve or you can say, I'm going to serve anywhere. Something to keep in mind through the application process as well. And so I want to take a little break and talk about my service because sometimes it's just not tangible. You say, okay, this is what people are just gonna do, but what does that really look like? And as I said, no project is the same, but I'm just gonna talk about my project just to give you an idea of what a day in the life of a peaceful volunteer can look like in the education sector. So I was in a primary Spanish literacy, uh, in a elementary school as a primary Spanish literacy promoter. And I worked with a team of teachers, which you'll see on the bottom right hand side. And we, this was my squad for my time there. And uh, we still have great relationships today. And I love to talk about that because that really expresses the sustainability of, of Peace Corps is um, collaborating with them. And so the one at the bottom, we worked together on creating different literacy tools, different literacy strategies, tutoring groups, as well as um, parents, you know, after school parent groups, how to get parents more involved in their students' education and finding ways to increase the literacy rate um, within um, from third grade, from first to second grade. And so uh, this is just, you know, my favorite picture of us actually. And, uh, and it's really great when I speak with them and they still talk to me today and say, hey, we're still using the tool that we created together, you know, it's been like our first few months here. And so I think that's so beautiful because we're creating things that are meant to last. You're not coming in just to do a project and leave. You're creating things that are going to be used after after you're gone. And hopefully, you know, once you are out of that country, they have all the tools they need to complete the project that they have, um, you know, specified that they want assistance with. And so that just circles back to our mission. Um, and this is just some tutoring groups that we worked on together. And then on the top right or the top left, uh, working with uh, individuals specifically, and then that kind of tied to our our um, our secondary project is working with adolescents after school. And so just a quick view of, you know, what a little bit of my service looked like, what potentially your service could look like wherever it is you may go. So now I would like to talk about the benefits because why do you want to be peaceful if there are any benefits for you and for the communities? And so while you're in service, you are receiving a living stipend. I know people hear volunteer but in the beginning and think, I can't give my kids to you, it's just not the case. But it is because this is a government agency, this is a government program, and so everything is paid for. Starting from your flight to the host country, to your you know, your flight home, your transportation within the country is also paid for, um, as well as your housing. So you might find yourself living with a host family like myself. I've lived with a host family my entire time. Some countries you can move out on your own if you so choose, but um, I really am a strong proponent for host families. And um, you also have your medical and dental coverage taken care of while you're in service. And I can definitely say that's a, it's a beautiful benefit because uh, there's no copay. So I don't know if anyone here has to pay you know, for their own medical things, but it's just really great to not have to pay for a root canal when I was in service and that was paid $1,000 for a year. Um, not saying go to service and get root canal done, but um, those things might happen. And um, you also have student loan deferment. So if you 
car like myself and have some student loans still. Um, they are, they can be deferred and they can also count towards your public service loan forgiveness if any of you all are gonna work in that public service um, after that. Um, so those two years count towards the payment of that forgiveness. Um, and I have heard that Perkins loans no longer exist until I've been told through the grapevine. But when I was in college, they, they were, and some people may be in their first freshman year might have a Perkins loan. Those are also eligible for cancellation, partial cancellation um, with the use of Florida. So keep this in mind as well. And so um, you also get incredible vacation time. You get about 48 vacation days, which is way more than the vacation time I have right now. And you can use that to travel throughout the country to visit other volunteers, to see you know, the places you're serving outside of the community where you're gonna be in. Uh, currently, due to COVID, uh, they're not really able to do too much travel, you know, to other countries because of uh, just those health protocols. But maybe by the time you all are in service, that won't be in place. So previously, you were able to, you know, go home or you were able to, um, you know, visit a different country, a neighboring country, if you weren't on the island like myself. Um, and one of the other great things about Seaport is just those career skills and training that you're going to receive. I mentioned that from your first three months of service. You're going to receive technical skills training for whatever sector you're going to be in, language skills training that um, is really incredible uh, because you are learning, sometimes you're going to countries where you don't know the language. But by the time you're entering service, you're going to be at a level you can at least communicate with um, with your uh, host country. And then by the time you're leaving, you're going to be at least conversational, if not fluent in that language. And so that is something that's really incredible and learning a language is very hard. And so having that benefit, having that on your resume is going to take you many places um, in the future. And so while you're in service, I did mention our medical and dental coverage. Um, but outside of that, we have a full team of safety uh, and security officers to make sure that you can serve safely and effectively in service because you can't be an effective volunteer if you don't feel safe and then you're not healthy. So you have access to our 24 seven medical officers. And so if you have any needs, anything that happens during service, um, you can contact them with anything and they'll be there for you. You have those specific resources and so um, they will help you get whatever needs you might have for whatever condition or injury that you're experiencing. And our safety officers for people, for, for everyone really, because they are vetting the communities that you're going to first. So you're not gonna show up to a community that doesn't know that you're coming, that they're not ready for you. They have been trained and they know um, that you're a volunteer and they're gonna be looking out for your safety. And so the safety officer is also there for, in case anything happens and you feel uncomfortable, you just have a question, say, hey, I didn't feel safe in the situation and you can talk to them about it, you know, and they will handle that and they will speak to community members about um, your safety and anything of that nature. And so I really felt comfortable and protected knowing that I had that in place. And then also having to circle back to the fact that we are a government agency. And so we have that that um, support while you are abroad. For example, being, you know, having there be a global pandemic during our service, it was less than 24 hours when we found out that we were leaving and the time off on the plane. It was very quick, very swift, and very um, efficient, and very sad to leave in less than 24 hours, but just knowing that something that is happening, if there's ever any sort of unrest or any type of natural disaster, the government, you're gonna be looked after. You don't have to worry, how am I gonna get home, or how am I gonna get my stuff, or you know, none of that, um, that chaos, that confusion. So I really think that's a plus of being a seaport. And so also, while you're there, you do have, um, the community immersion training, which I mentioned to those families. And you just really have a whole team of people who are supporting you. You have um, peaceful volunteer leaders, you have the host country nationals, they're all there to make sure that you can do your job to the best of your ability. And there are also um, what we call uh, like advocacy groups. And so for people from different backgrounds or the marginalized groups, you can feel supported with any other identity that you have while you are in service. So now that you know, you know what you have going for you, in service, I think it's a great time to talk about what's gonna happen for you after service because the benefits don't stop. Um, when you first come back, you do receive $10,000 in a readjustment allowance. This by, you know, to this day is the most money I've ever had in my bank account at one time, just sitting there. Um, and you can use it however you choose. And so a lot of people pre-pandemic would travel. Um, people also put down payments on either homes or car or whatever stage you are in your life or helping you to, if you're gonna move after peace school, maybe you're gonna start grad school, we can basically help you, you know, with furnishing an apartment or going towards a graduate school with funds. And speaking of graduate school, you also have um, access to our Coverdell Fellowship Program, which gives you incredible um, graduate school benefits at a reduced cost. So all 
partners. We are partnered with over 160 different universities, 200 different programs, where they have to give you at least 25% tuition coverage. Um, American University is also a partner with Coverdale, so they have um, some graduate school benefits, you know, depending on what program that you do. So, so don't keep in mind if you want to continue on at AU after, um, after your time at the sport. Um, but this, these universities still have the actual and there are um, master's programs, there are a couple of JD and PhD programs as well. And you can do Coverdale as many times as you would like. So if you decide you want to do two or three masters, Coverdale that many times. And so um, something that's really great, you know, because education is essential, it's also valuable. And so if you're interested in working in the government, I know Patricia mentioned, oh, I want to go to the Foreign Service, or I want to work with USAID. Use Sport is a great gateway to that, it's a great, um, you know, connector because Personally, I can say I tried to work for the government after college. USA Jobs is a, like a dark hole. It's just you, you submit your application. You think, oh my God, I just went to college. I just graduated. My resume looks incredible, and you will hear nothing. And it's just really discouraging. But after Peace Corps, after I completed service, I it was a completely opposite experience. I had offers from the Department of State, the Department of Labor, FEMA. It was just all of a sudden I was visible just with my Peace Corps service. And part of that is due to the fact that you have non-competitive eligibility, which is the Federal Employment Advantage, also known as NCE. And so basically that means you're applying as if you were like an internal applicant. It looks as if you have something similar to veteran's preference. And so your application essentially kind of gets moved to the top of the pile because you already, uh, you don't have, you're just, you're starting with um, something that you wouldn't have without Peace Corps. It's, it's NCE is also given to um, people who do AmeriCorps as well sometimes. And so it's a really great benefit. You can use it for the first 12 months after your Peace Corps service. Or if you do graduate school, you can put it on pause until after graduate school, then you can use your NCE status to help you get a government job. And so um, if you ever have more questions about that, that's also something that Peace Corps offers. We have the, the professional networking and career services. And so after service, we're still gonna you know, support you. We're not we're not tossing to the side after service. So people who have questions about you know, what to do in a career, help with their resume or, or personal statements. We have, you know, webinars and different uh, different uh, conferences for those things. And so you can ask your questions there. They'll present information for you. And some of those are about the non-competitive eligibility or just how to get into government jobs or networking with other returned Peace Corps volunteers who are already in these positions. And luckily being in the Washington DC area, we have the largest R RPCV returned Peace Corps volunteer network. And so, I can attest to being in different Facebook groups and different chats, uh, WhatsApp chats about people just uploading jobs. Oh, my job, my um, agency calling for this, or I think you all be great for this. And just having that connection is incredible because, as we all know, you can have a degree, but if you don't have a connection, it's very difficult to get yourself into positions where you're more than qualified to be in. Very sad, but it is the truth that you know college students just not enough to give you to get you to some of these jobs. And so, what can be done? for you. And so also after service, I did mention um, a public service loan forgiveness. So that's automatically get that you do have to be able to pay for it um, for 10 years. And then also just the um, having health insurance as well when you return to service. It's good to be in that in between um, you know in between jobs. And so you will have health insurance. Yeah, the next so now hopefully you all are wondering um, how do I become a volunteer? This sounds incredible, right? Right. So um, this is a look at our, um, the overview, the lifetime or lifespan of a um, applicant for Peace Corps. And so what you're going to do to start off your process is you are going to look for a position. You're going to go into our website and, and see, you know, maybe you're going to serve where you need it most, or maybe you know you want to be a true economic development volunteer. You, can, you already have plans for yourself. Where are those? Like myself. And so you're going to go to our website. Maybe you're going to search by region. Like I know I want to serve in the African region, so I'm going to go straight to that. Or you know that you have a background in Spanish and you really want to utilize your Spanish skills or your French skills. So you're going to go and search by that. And you're going to find the position that's best for you. And then from there, uh, you're going to I'm going to put a plug in and reach out to your recruiter like myself because we know what app what um placement specialists are looking for when they are reviewing applications. We know if you know the resume is full or not or the motivation statement. You know we are going to help you all to have put forth the best application possible. So once you feel like you know you want to apply, you reach out to a recruiter. And then from there, yeah, application is very easy, it's very short. But the longest part is gonna be your resume. It is a federal resume. It can be two to three pages long. You wanna see everything. 
Uh, there is no experience that is not valuable. We're not just looking for professional or internship experiences, volunteering, campus leadership, community involvement, all those things are valuable. Uh, and from there, you're gonna submit along with your motivation statement, which is just you expressing, why do you wanna do Peace Corps? There are so many different uh, different volunteer organizations that go abroad and that do service work. So you really gotta reflect and think, what about Peace Corps really aligns with you know, your interests and your, you know, your career goals and your personal goals and seeing how that fits in and then talking about what you plan to contribute, you know, what skills are you bringing to service? Because like I mentioned before, we are sending qualified, you know, individuals to go and be a part of these projects. And then the last thing you're going to think about, what are you hoping to gain from Peace Corps? Because we're not just going and giving, this is an exchange. You have to think about what you're uh, wanting to receive from the host country, because just as much as you have to give, they have to give as well. Uh, from there, the application is done, you're away, this is a placement specialist, and you're going to wait to hear back about um, where you've been placed and if you're going to have an interview. But in the meantime, you're going to have your health history form, and so that's just going to help us figure out where can we send you. You know, we want to make sure that whatever country you go to, they can support whatever health needs you may have. So, for example, somebody has a peanut allergy, we might not send to Thailand because, you know, they, a lot of things are made with peanuts, and we don't want to worry about a lot of things that have no reactions. And so that's an idea of what the health history form is there for. Um, and as I mentioned, after um, submit all those things, you're going to hopefully get an interview offer. And from there, uh, you can also reach back out to your recruiter, myself, and we will help you with interview prep because interview is a little intense. It takes an hour, hour and a half interview, uh, and a lot of questions and a lot of uh, behavioral questions. You want to make sure that you are ready and able to put you know your best foot forward because sometimes it's not that you're not a great candidate, but being able to to um, express that and make that um, presentable and visible to your placement officer. And from there, you know, hopefully you're receiving the invitation. And when you receive the invitation, you do have about uh, two to three business days to respond. You know, so we think you beforehand what you want to do because we want to be able to um, quickly call attention because we have a volunteer for you. But if not, then you're able to reach out to maybe someone else who would be eligible or a great fit for that. And from there, you're gonna have what I think the longest part is our medical and legal parents. My legal parents took about seven months. And so that's why we have that um, have that, that gap. So I always say, if you wanna apply for Peace Corps, you wanna put your application in um, nine to 12 months before you actually wanna leave. So for example, my senior year, if you wanted to leave um, right after graduation or in the summer, you're gonna want to apply uh, around now. We have an October 1st deadline coming up. And so you would want to get your application in because by the time you're finished all your classes, you're going to be departing in, in the um, in the summer. So that is the application that you need to get by the end of um, August. So keeping that in mind, always knowing about a year out is when you should be preparing to apply. So if you want to leave in 2023 December, maybe around the, the uh, end of this year, start thinking about where you want to go, looking at a website for positions. But I will talk more about that on Thursday, about that whole application process and timeline and things of that nature. But just to give you all a little taste today. Um, and from there, you're going to do your onboarding. It takes about a couple months, but just a few things you do online. And then from after that, you're going to be boarding a plane and doing the rest of your training in country um, with the host community, with your host community, with our team of um, you know trainers out in whatever country you're electing us to be in. And so, that is the, the short and long of, you know, Peace Corps, our application, and how you can verify your skills and your skills and your skills and be able to And so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. Sometimes they come later. I know for myself, I always just take it as much questions or talk during the daytime. So that's why my QR code is here. So you can reach out to me via email um, or, yeah, just my email my phone number i'm always in different places so trying to call me is a little tough but i am always responsive to you know any questions or concerns and there's no there's no dumb question at all i mean there's just so many different things about people or people are so unique it's you know a big step it is two years so it's always natural to have concerns and talk. so um feel free to jot down my information i do have business cards here as well and we have you know a good like 20 minutes or so just to talk with you all about questions or just thoughts you have throughout this presentation. So thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to turn the floor over to you all and I will bring the mic to whoever has a question or if there are any questions from our chat, um, please let me know. No questions. No thoughts. Yes. 
Oh, wait, sorry, I had to come. Yeah, I don't mind walking. So, where do you work now, and what jobs were you offered when you left the Peace Corps? Here. Great question. So I do currently work with Peace Corps. This was the job I decided to take. Um, I work as a recruiter. Uh, I've been in this position for about two years now. And um, based in the DC area, I'm from here, so I kind of got to stay where I was from, which is great. But jobs that I was offered, uh, I was offered, oh, remembering all those jobs. Okay, I was offered a job with FEMA. I cannot remember what exactly the job was. But it was with FEMA, they had a webinar first just to get information about it. So that was great that they had that as something that I could um, attend as a potential Peace Corps volunteer, just, you know, kind of like an informational meeting. And then from there, um, I'm sorry, it's over two years ago, I can't say the specific job, but then also the Department of Labor, uh, I think as a wage, something with wages. And then, um, there was another one as an interviewee with Spanish. So they wanted somebody who spoke Spanish, so that was perfect. Um, maybe there's something I'll do later on, but uh, that's also another job with the Department of Labor that was offered to me. And then Department of State as a uh, passport specialist were, were some of the jobs that I was offered. But the Department of State, those clearances took a really long time. Like, yes. So that's why I ended up not taking that one. It came later on, but I don't know if that's um, must have been for work. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to bring this microphone to you. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about um, like the living stipend? Great question. Living stipend. We must know how we are going to survive. So um, you are receiving money directly to like you're going to have a um, like an account, like a bank account in the country where you're going to be serving. And so I will speak about my own experience. I received about 300 US dollars a month. I know. So, but 300 US dollars a month was more than enough to live comfortably in the Dominican Republic, paying my rent, paying for my food, paying for my transportation, going on vacation. I just, $300, you know, really takes too far. But it's, of course, that's not comparable to a US salary. So you're not going to be receiving a salary. You're going to be receiving enough to be able to live in the country that you're serving um, comfortably. And so, um, and while you're in training, you're going to receive money sort of separate from that $300 in training because uh, you're not in your site yet. You're still living with the host family. So some things are going to be taken care of. And um, I think there's anything else I need to mention on the stipend. Um, notice that. So it's going to be based off of whatever country you're in. Every country you know has different cost of living. And so they've already taken care of that. And uh, they'll take care of everything. Is that answer your question? Great. Okay, I saw another hand. Yes. So the Peace Corps does a lot of preparation for the volunteers going, like three months. How does it prepare the communities that you're going into also for those? That's a great question. So, and that's why our application process is so long. So when, you're, when we are first um, listing these positions, remember they have asked for volunteers from us. And so, um, all starts with their government. So not only the country has asked for volunteers, actually the specific community also has to express that they have a desire um, to work with a volunteer. And so like our website now has positions that are not leaving until the summer of next year. So that's that time period where they're preparing. There is a team of um, Peace Corps staff that actually work in the country where, where we serve. And so we collaborate with host country nationals as well. And so I can't speak too much about what goes on there because I am a domestic um, worker, but I do know just from my experience being there that they are um, they're constantly doing in interviews with host families. I've been present for some of those interviews where you know making sure that wherever you go is going to you know are they um, equipped, are they prepared, are they able to house you? Um, they're going to be scouting out the school and seeing well, you're going to be in the school system, so but you know seeing that there's going to be there is a specific project that you're going to be doing, making sure you're just not showing up and there's nothing for you to do. And so um, I can't say how many months we dedicate to it, but I know it definitely takes place in advance before you're arriving because by the time you're there, you know, there has to be a place for you. And so um, just know that that is taken care of by the, the, um, our staff overseas. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Yeah. I was wondering how Peace Corps dealt with like safety and LGBTQ identity. Is that something that our communities are receptive to or most like volunteers feel like they should be out. 
that's definitely a great question. Um, we do we do send volunteers to places maybe where um, they're not they're not going to be as receptive as the United States. We're, you know, we are going to countries that um, just have different worldviews, and so we can never say I can never say I cannot speak for a country specifically, but I can't speak for uh, what I've seen when I was volunteering. So as I mentioned, we have different groups that are there, support groups for people of marginalized communities, including you know, Black and Brown, Indigenous volunteers, people of the plus community, making sure that they feel safe and service. And so volunteers have their own their own unique experiences. There are some who feel comfortable coming out in their community. I know one volunteer, her whole family was very um, receptive, but and then other people who didn't feel safe doing that. And so some people who unfortunately aren't closeted during service because, because of just worldviews that are not like our own and some, some that are based in religion and just some that are just um, based culturally. And so, um, but we do not send volunteers, especially our um, same sex couples, for example, where we're being um, gay or um, it's illegal. So that's something that we definitely do not do for our um, same sex couples because that is something that we are very aware of, but every volunteer is gonna have their own um, preference and they're gonna feel out how they feel um, it's best for them in their service and being accepted. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, okay, great. Yes. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, how is communication back home on Peace Corps trips? Does data work? Is there internet? Do letters get sent? Yes, we love to stay connected. Uh, letters are sent. I did receive a letter too when I was in service. But as I mentioned, every person's service is going to be different. Um, so access to internet can be different, you know, based even in the same country. Um, I didn't have constant, um, constant internet, but I was able to purchase it, you know, like I fit it into my budget. So, okay, I'll purchase it for this week, a um, certain amount of data that could be used. Um, I know WhatsApp is probably the most popular thing. If you don't already have WhatsApp, you will probably have WhatsApp once you're in service. Um, and you can, like I was able to, you know, video chat uh, with my family, but I know I, I had volunteer friends who had zero electricity. And so Wi-Fi was not a thing at all. And so for her, she would go to like an internet cafe. Um, I can't remember how far it was from her. Or maybe at least an hour or so journey, but you know, really scheduling that time and you know, okay, this is the time I'm gonna, you know, go to this cafe and chat with my friends and chat with my family. Um, so it all varies very differently. Even for my friend who was in the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic with me, he was in a very mountainous region and service was just not his friend. It was very hot and cold. And so even though he had internet, I mean internet and um electricity didn't always have service. And so um, it really will vary, but you'll always have peace, you'll always have internet at our Peace Corps office. And so whenever I was in the Capitol, I would just go to the Peace Corps office, maybe, you know, download whatever onto my phone to have offline for later and do any of those communications. But um, there's always snail mail. It will be really slow. <laughs> any other questions in our chat from my people here? Yeah. So how does Peace Corps, when it comes to volunteering, ensure that everything's like community centered and not like me coming as an American, knowing everything and trying to like fix everything? Yeah, great question. And that really circles back to our um our first goal, which is you know meeting the needs of um interested countries. And so they're interested in Peace Corps. They are reaching out to us for specific projects that they have. We're not coming in and assessing and thinking, I think that you all need to incorporate this to do X, Y, and Z. That is not the kind of organization we are. We can only go where they have asked for us. And so not only ask for us, but ask for something specific. And so there are localized projects that they are asking us to collaborate on. And that's where we have the possible, you know, when we, when we see our um, job listings or our volunteer positions on our website, they're very, they have desired and required skills. And these are the things that they have asked for on here. This is what they're seeking. And so um, from there, we kind of give them the best map. We kind of find the best volunteer to fulfill that need. So um, everything starts with the host country and then sure, but then you have a responsibility as well to not perpetuate, um, you know, 
harmful things of like, well, I think that you all need to do this. It's, that's not our job. And so even when I mentioned with the secondary project, they also have to be interested in that secondary project. I can't want to teach French and like, I don't, no one here wants to learn French. But I think you all should learn, I think it'll be really, that's not what they're doing. So being cognizant of that and making, you know, being, having that self-awareness too, making sure that you're reflecting on what you're doing and you're constantly staying in communication with your host country, um, your host community. And um, your first three months as well, or your second half of three months, once you get to your site, is doing a community diagnostic. And so you're just observing. You're really just observing those first few months. We're not coming in after our training like, wow, I learned so much. Let me just come in and you know, tell you all what's going on, what you need to do here, even though they've asked for us. No, we're observing those, those first three months after training just to see what the community is like what they're telling you they need because they used to do um, interviews, information interviews with different community members like, hey, you know, like what's going on here? What you know? Talk to them like individuals and they're going to express things that they, they've they noticed or they want. And then that's your responsibility to take that and, you know, you know figure out how you can collaborate. That's the key word, collaboration. Um, you're not you're not here saving anyone, helping but helping you. And so always keeping that in mind as you are preparing for I will come to you and get those. Thank you. So I have two questions. So the first is, um, how often do you get to take a trip home? Um, and then the second is, what is it like moving out there, like moving your life, upgrading your life to go out to these places? Great questions. Questions I do have. Um, so the first part, Due to COVID, um, it's very hard to say right now how often you can go home. I know currently for the volunteers we first sent back in March, um, they are not they are not able to go home, you know, whenever they want to. It's mainly for like emergency, you know, family emergency, then you know you could go home. Previously, before um, COVID, we could go home when you you have those forty eight vacation days as I mentioned, and so those vacation days could be used however you choose. Some people like, like to travel throughout the country, travel to different countries. Some people tra travel home. I know I um, went home uh, for the holidays once. And, um, but realizing too that that traveling home is not in your, uh, it's not in your stipend. You all know I made $300 a month. There was no flight that was being bought um, <laughs> for me on my stipend. And so something to keep in mind, if you know you wanna travel home, that you maybe you have a wedding or something that you want to attend, making sure maybe you save that money in advance or maybe your family's gonna sponsor you. Um, but currently we're not um, doing this inter-country traveling, but I'm sure by the time you all are um, you know, volunteers, that will be different. And your second question, how do you, like, was it getting prepared to leave or how you're moving all your stuff out there? Yes, um, so you're gonna have, if I'm remembering correctly, we have two check bags two check bags, your carry-on, and your personal item. And so, yes, it's it's tough to, you know, think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be here for two years. How am I gonna pack all of this into these two bags here or these two bags? But I think I did pretty well. Um, we do have different events that happen throughout the throughout the year. And one of them is our packing list event. So I definitely recommend to keep up with our website to see that. But I will say we have different packing lists on our website. Even for the country you're going to, we'll have um, things that you think that you will need there. And so um, we're not, re not going to recommend using a lot of clothing because something I've said to people before, your really nice clothing that you really love, you know, no, don't bring like your favorite pair of jeans because the environment's different. And so like washing clothes there might be different than it is here. The water situation will be different. And so you might find things that you love being damaged. And so we recommend that volunteers buy their clothing there. like. Um, there's definitely a lot of what we call it in the DR or Papa is like um, secondhand shopping. And then I definitely bought a lot of my own clothes, but I need something for my home. Um, Cause you want to see what the environment's like, what's the weather like, uh, what's everyone else wearing. And um, that's something on clothing. You're going to bring your electronics, you know, your laptop. And um, I recommend like a Kindle, something for reading um, and anything for like, um, like solar, solar powered like lanterns and things like that. Uh, like a external charger. So we have like a different event for like packing list, but you do, you will have, I think, two 50 pound bags, like this size, like carry on one of those little bags and then the personal items. You'll have enough space for everything. 
but I also recommend reaching out to previous volunteers too um, because they'll tell you, mm, actually, I don't need that. You don't need that. And um, yeah, so I don't want to talk too long about packing because I could go on forever. Um, does that answer your question though? Yes? Okay. You had a question, right? Well, okay. So uh, two questions. A, just to be clear, so we can choose what country we go to. That seems pretty. But then uh, the second one, how closely will we work with uh, the local government exactly? Yes, so you, you do have the ability to choose where you want to serve. Uh, I did that myself. I submitted an application for the Dominican Republic, but I also said I was open to being considered for other countries because you don't want to limit yourself to one country because sometimes it's not that you're not a great candidate for that country. We accept applications on a rolling basis. And so sometimes we've already got everyone that we believe we need for that for that um, country. And then you're like, well, I only want to go to Thailand. So I'm only going to go to Thailand. Like, we don't recommend that you do that. If you want to serve, put Thailand, but then also put, I'm open to serving in Latin America as well. So you have more options for yourself. And how, how close you work with the local government? Honestly, not too closely. I, I did not um, because it really depends on your project. Sometimes um, maybe government officials might come to your community to see what's going on. I know La Plan met, you know, the ambassador for um, the U.S. who was in the Dominican Republic, um, but I wasn't working with them. So they might want to come out and see what you're doing, but you're working with a specific community organization. Um, but the government tell us that um, they want to work with for and then and they come forward with us. That makes sense. Um, the last one on the hand? Yes, oh, she went over there. So we have two additional questions in the chat. The first one is, um, are there any eligibility issues when it comes to dual citizenship? And I'll just read off the second one too. Um, do you have any advice on maintaining a relationship during your trips for Peace Corps? <laughs> okay, let's start with dual citizenship because that other one is tough. Um, so there are, um, there are some countries where you cannot have dual citizenship. Unfortunately, I cannot remember right now. I know one of them is Colombia and Morocco, I think of the others, there's three, but I'm, those are the two. I'm sure about Colombia, you can't have dual citizenship. Um, so only about three countries. So you'll have other options out of all the other ones. Um, and, I'll, I'll, um, and maintaining a relationship. Yes, very difficult. <laughs> it's already difficult maintaining relationships like here when they're already here. And so um, we also have events about that too. There are events about everything. But um, because it's challenging, because you're gonna maybe you're gonna be in a completely different time zone sometimes. If you're uh, here and you're your partner is in, in Africa, maybe six hours ahead, six hours behind, or they're in Thailand, like what, 12 hours ahead or something like that, it's gonna be difficult. So there needs to be conversations with your partner um, about what you're wanting to do. Um, and how you all think it's you know, you know, holistic for you all to maintain your relationship. Your partner can visit you. Well, currently with the pro the COVID protocols, no. But previously, you know, they can come. If my family came and visited me. Um, that can also happen. And um, trying to schedule those video calls and letters. But if you really do want to know, there are volunteers who can talk about their experiences um, maintaining um, a relationship. I was not one of those. So. Um, yes, there's a question asking. So like dual citizenship, does that mean you can't be a citizen of the country you're going to? You can't like in general have dual citizenship. Thank you for um, that clarification. Yeah, so you, um, you can be a dual citizen. It's for like, if for example, the one country I'm sure about is Colombia. You couldn't be a Colombian uh, citizen and a US citizen for that country, but you could be a dual citizen, you know, with maybe Paraguay and serving in Colombia. It's just this is that. Um, so thank you, I was not clear about that. But I will look into the other, so whoever is, um, who had this question, they wanna follow up with me via email, I can provide the, the countries that you cannot be a dual citizen of and serve in. Yes, great questions. Okay, any other questions that you have like seven minutes, right? 
So what would you recommend on uh, like the next step for someone who is interested in flying? Like personally, I, I'm a senior, so. Senior year, a blessed tie. So um, follow up with me. I, I really recommend that you, well, first you can take a look at the website and see uh, what positions interest you. Like, what are you, what are you studying? Okay. Have you uh, have you taken Spanish? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So that that's something you want to be you know for our Spanish speaking countries you do have to have two semesters minimum of Spanish speak Spanish. Um. So that's great. So you already know what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Woo. Um. But yeah, so I mentioned the Spanish speaking countries need two semesters of Spanish. Um, and then you're gonna look at the, that position. You look at the desired and required skills and then you can reach out to me and we can start working on your resume because um, we wanna make sure you're using keywords from the, uh, from the project description in your resume. So that when the placement office is looking through it, they're gonna see those keywords jumping out. Okay, they already have this, they already have that. Um, and then you're gonna want to get your application in I know it's the, the deadline is um, October 1st, pop, is that an October 1st deadline one? I will try before October 1st. Um, I have application workshop on this Thursday. I think right back here. And we can talk more about the application. Um, but definitely follow up with me via email and we can start working on, on your application. You wanna get it in as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, just really looking through that project and making sure it lines up with your resume. So that you have a nothing base required skills, all the required skills, and then having at least a few of the desired skills, if you don't have them, it's still time to start doing other volunteer um, projects. Like you don't have to have everything together when you apply. For example, when I applied and interviewed, they told me, okay, you know, there are, there are other people who are more competitive than you. Like, imagine leaving an interview knowing that. It's like, oh, okay, thank you. But it really put, you know, a little, a little fire beneath me. And you know, I was looking to see how I could find other positions in the community. I'm from this area, and so I looked into volunteering um, in Columbia Heights as a teaching Spanish to um, adult immigrants. And so, which is very similar to what I was going to be doing in the Dominican Republic, teaching Spanish to children. And so, I reached out to my placement officer like a week after my interview, and was like, "I'm now going to be volunteering, you know, four hours a week with this organization. I really think this is going to be more effective as a volunteer." I think the next day I had an offer to, to, to serve. And so I cannot say one plus one equal two, but I really think it did in that situation because it was very much like they saw that you were still willing to gain more experience to, um, you know, to be more effective in service versus like, oh, we don't have time for that. You know, so still be looking for ways to, to match the project description and to get more experience up until the next season if you can I know going to school. Um, very good question. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, I have one. I'm sorry. Um, going off of that, um, I'm a first year master's student, so I'm a little bit different. Um, and I did a lot of research in undergrad about Peace Corps. Um, and I was just wondering how some of this advice applies to masters because it's literally like a full time job. So trying to do um volunteer work that i did in undergrad to prepare isn't really plausible now you know what i mean right so also having a master's degree is going to make you more competitive alone so um it, it's really going to depend on what the project is you're trying to do because you might already have the experiences um, i speak on this as someone who had experiences but not competitive enough. I was going up against people with master's degrees and people who maybe who had already taught in school. And so um, really think about what sector you're trying to serve in. And in, in your undergrad years, if you ever had an experience, maybe, you know, volunteering in any capacity or maybe you took some relevant courses. So making sure we're, we're listing relevant courses on our resume as well. Um, it's gonna be helpful for you. And um, you're gonna be starting off on different platforms than the rest of us with a master's degree. So don't worry too much about um, community involvement, but even sometimes if it's just something, it doesn't have to be a constant community service. Yes, I was doing this crisis research as an undergrad doing something, you know, once a month for like, you know, three or four hours with students who have some experience, who have worked with people from different backgrounds. So really big thing 
for some people we're going to ask you know have you worked with people um from communities that are different than yours have you um you know worked in an unstructured environment or if not if it's not structured you're not going to receive a blueprint on every single day you do this so those are other things that are really valuable it doesn't just have to be um you know weekly continuous service yeah um what what advice would you give if that you wish you had before you went or you applied it? Advice. Um, some advice that I wish I had been given was just to um, to be easy on yourself, to not be, a, a, um, just to give yourself a little grace because it's gonna be very stressful. It's gonna be very, um, very unique not even unique to having the right word, um, because you're going to be somewhere where you are going to be a little bit like a fish out of water. I thought, oh, I've studied abroad before. I know what it's like to live in another country, you know, and it's not the same. It's not the same, like, being in a community. There's no one else there maybe that looks like you or who speaks your language. And so uh, that can be something that um, it takes some time to adapt to. And so kind of, you know, not think that, well, everyone seems to be having fun. Like, I see all these pictures from people in Peace Corps. I mean, why am I not in that space? And so really being easy on yourself with that. And then also um, realizing that you're there for a reason. I think I suffered a lot with imposter syndrome when I was in Peace Corps. Like, I'm not really, why am I here? I'm not qualified to do this. I can't, I, I who am I to be doing this project? And so really, um, really reflecting on that and realizing that you were chosen for a reason. So it's really, I think the most challenges were all all in my head for Peace Corps because I think we think, oh, it's gonna be so fun going to a different country, living with people and not realizing you're gonna be working there. You're going to be contributing ideas. You're gonna be with people who are specialized. Like I'm working with teachers who've been working for 20 years. Who am I to come in and say, I have ideas. You know, I'm like, I I was, I'm not a teacher. I mean, yes, I've, I've taught a lot, but who am I to come into a country and you just teach 20 years here? I have, I've had the same life training. And so the training is definitely very sufficient, but if you're like me, you might start to think you might struggle with that. And so I, would, I guess some advice would be just to really um, and realize it's going to take time. Building the, building the trust in the community is going to take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Which is why people are two years long, 27 months, because sometimes it takes that first year, the first, you know, six, seven months to really realize you know, you're there to really uh, connect with them. You're not there just to be like, oh, I'm here. Don't use my thing as, like, hey, I, I wrote something and I'm going. You want to really see your intention. And it takes time to build that and to realize that you don't get any true, genuine friendship overnight either. And I don't think I did that. No, I was like, no one talks to me. Like, why can't I, you know, not no one, but you know, like, I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not doing the same work my friends are doing because, of course, social media is, you know, friend and enemy. So, um, yeah, I think it also goes down to being on yourself. It's going to take time. I think I'm not to about that, so I will not. Um, any other questions? I think we're maybe at time. I don't know if there's anything in the chat or any lingering questions. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time and participation. I really appreciate it. And pleasure here. Feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Michaela. And thank you all for coming. Um, just to reiterate, she Michaela will be back this Thursday from 12 to 1.30 in the same space um, to go through the Peace Corps workshop. So that'll be more in depth on the application process and so forth. So feel free to come with your questions about that. And yeah, I just want to extend a thank you again for your time and we wish everyone a great afternoon. Thank you to our virtual viewers as well. Okay, have a good one, everybody.